All right, well, we're at two minutes past six, so I think we probably ought to get things started. So uh, I'm gonna turn things over to Ben Simons, our executive director here at Telfer Museums to, to get us started. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, we are so excited to present Curator's Choice, an exhibition of highlights from the permanent collection of Telfair Museums. And we are uh, honored tonight to be joined by um, all of the contributors to the catalog publication, which is a Telfair publication in partnership with Scala, and including um, uh, former curator, chief curator, Courtney McNeil, who is now director and chief curator of the Baker Museum in Naples, Florida, and Shannon Browning Mullis, who's the executive director of the Juliet Gordon Lowe birthplace here in Savannah. So we're so thrilled to have, to have the team back together that, that produced this wonderful exhibition uh, and catalog. Um, I would like to take a, just a minute to thank um, those sponsors who made the exhibition possible, which includes the city of Savannah, the Georgia Council for the Arts, the Terra Foundation for American Art, and additional support was provided by Mrs. Inga A. Brassler. Thank you very much for that. And also would like to especially thank the uh, Telfair Academy Guild TAG for sponsoring tonight's lecture and the publication as well. Thank you to all, of the, all the leadership and members of TAG for, for all that you do for Telfair Museums. Um, we are gonna jump right into the lightning rounds here um, and Shannon will, will start us off. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Shannon Browning Mullis. I, as Ben mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Juliet Gordon Lowe Birthplace, but was formerly the curator of history and decorative arts for Telfair Museums. And it was so much fun to put these works together and to get to investigate them a little bit. So I'm delighted to be here to talk with you about them tonight. Um, you know, even more exciting than these pieces are the lives of the folks who make them. Now, frustratingly, women in the historical record are often only positioned as accessories to men. The education of prominent men is documented, but the record on female education is scant. The historical record does show that most girls were educated in domestic arts and that almost all female educations included needlework. Sarah Jones created this sampler, the earliest one known in Georgia, uh, to showcase her achievements when she was seven years old. Sarah was directly related to prominent men, but she was a significant human in her own right. Her grandparents were among the first English colonists in the colony, accompanying Oglethorpe in 1733. By the time Sarah was born in 1756, her family had established Wormslow Plantation, where they enslaved numerous people in agricultural labor, and the men in her family had become involved in politics. When Sarah created this sampler in 1763, the colony was only 30 years old. Like many samplers of the period, this one displayed stitches via the religious texts that were part of most children's education. They included the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed. According to Kathy Staples' research on samplers, the specific text for her Ten Commandments came from a guide to the English tongue in two parts by Reverend Thomas Dyke. It was featured in other 18th century samplers. Sarah married John Glenn when she was 15 years old. Her husband and father soon became active in the revolutionary cause, organizing a provincial Congress. In the ensuing years, John Glenn became chief, Ju chief justice under the revolutionary government. He fled Savannah in the wake of the British, relocated to Charleston without his family, was imprisoned by the British and eventually switched sides in the revolution, swearing a loyalty oath to the crown. Sarah's father was likewise indisposed in the war. He was held prisoner uh, by the British in Florida. After the war, John Glenn suffered the consequences of his fickleness. His property was confiscated and he was banished from Savannah and Charleston. Ch uh, Sarah and their children did not accompany him. It was Sarah who eventually brought her husband redemption petitioning the General Assembly in 1784. Over the next 10 years, he rebuilt his fortune and political career, eventually serving as mayor before his death in 1799. During her life, Sarah bore between 10 and 14 children, depending on the source, and survived a war while raising them without local male support. 
After her husband's death, Sarah moved to Connecticut where several of her children were educated, including her daughter, Mary Jones Glenn, whose education, like her mother's, included needlework. Like many enslaved potters, David Drake created thousands of vessels in his life, but unlike any other known, he signed hundreds of them and inscribed dozens with poems and verses. The first mention of Dave comes from an 1818 mortgage agreement in which he served as collaterals for his owners. But it's unlikely, uh, it's more likely that Harvey Drake actually purchased him a few years earlier when Dave was a young teenager. When he arrived at the pottery, he was tasked with supplying the factory. But within a few years, it seems that Harvey Drake began to teach Dave to turn pots. At this point in history, restrictions on teaching enslaved people to read and write were lenient. That changed in 1822 when Denmark Vesey, a literate free black man, was accused of plotting a revolt in Charleston. Southerners were afraid and leniency was over. At this point, Dave likely learned to be discreet about his literacy while continuing to absorb any information he could. And what you see here is Edgeville, South Carolina, which is where Dave was located uh, both at the Pottery and in this newspaper, The Hive, uh, which is where he worked from 1827 until 1821. When his enslavers uh, relocated the hive, he was returned to the pottery at that point. So from what we can piece together, it looks like Dave was married at least three times and he fathered several children. He experienced multiple family separations, prompting him in 1857 to inscribe a pot with, I wonder where is all my relation, friendship to all and every nation. My favorite inscription is from 1854. The jar says simply, L.M. says this handle will crack. L.M. referred to Lewis Miles, his enslaver at the time. I speculate that Lewis Miles walked by and noticed a handle Dave had created. He offered his opinion that it was not well crafted and would not last. Dave felt confident enough to stand by his work and to note Miles' comment. That was 165 years ago and the handle is still attached. After the Civil War, Dave registered to vote. In the 1868 and 1872 elections, Black South Carolinians turned out in force, electing Black candidates for more than half the offices. White South Carolinians were incredulous. The Ku Klux Klan and related organizations rose to suppress Black political participation. By 1876, they had effectively eliminated African American participation in the political system through a campaign of terror, assault, and murder. Dave's personal life had a happier ending. In 1870, one of his daughters, along with her husband and children, were living in Dave's home. One of his sons lived next door with his family. After 64 years of enslavement and separation from family, Dave chose when and for whom he would make his pots, and he lived among his family, teaching his trade to the next generation. The particular jar in Telfair's collection is notable for its large distinctive signature and for the date of production. The inscription reads, LM, June 18th, 1861, Dave. This jar is significant because it was created, signed, and dated during the Civil War, a time of hope and trepidation for enslaved people. Even during these unsettled times, Dave proudly inscribed his name. David Drake is the full name he chose after the Civil War ended. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I am delighted to be joining you all, and I'm so glad to be back with you for this opening tonight. Uh, my name is Courtney McNeil, and as Ben kindly mentioned in his introduction, I'm the former chief curator at Telfair Museums, and I'm presently here in sunny Naples, Florida, as the museum director and chief curator at the Baker Museum. Uh, so this project, the Curator's Choice Project, was one that was a really meaningful one for me because it allowed the whole team to come together and find their, their favorite works in the collection and get to talk about them in the, the publication and now in tonight's uh, remarks as well. And that when it came to which works to choose, choosing this painting here by George Bellows was a complete no brainer for me. This is the painting that was the, um, if the museum was on fire, I would go back in and carry this painting out, um, even if I had to struggle under its, its heavy frame and, and large size. Um, and for many reasons that I'm excited to share with you. 
So this painting is a beautiful work of art in its own right. It was created by George Bellows in 1911, and it's one of a series of paintings that he created in Manhattan's Riverside Park, looking over to the Palisades of New Jersey. And what I love about this painting is how he has really honed both the symmetry and the geometry of the canvas and the color palette. Uh, so at first glance, it just looks like a lovely landscape, but as you look closer, you see how thoughtful he was about every single element from the vertical lines created by the tree at the far left and the lamppost next to it, to all those strong horizontal lines created by the sky, the palisades, the ice in the river, and then the embankment um, with the people in, in front of them. The color palette is also a remarkable aspect of this work. If you look at it quickly, it looks like it's all, you know, blues and greens. In person, if you get up close, which I hope you all will in the current exhibition, you can see yellows, lilacs, and pops of red that enliven the entire canvas. Um, and then of course, George Bellows was famously a member of the Ashcan School of Artists who were rebelling against the American Impressionists of the late 19th and early 20th century by turning away from beautiful subject matter like wealthy ladies in a garden and was instead looking at everyday life in American cities. And he includes that as well and that beautiful little slice of everyday life down at the bottom where you see the man who has clearly stopped to tie his shoe on a park bench and the two ladies walking with the small dog and the two dogs are, are giving each other a look. The little dog there, the image is a little cut off here but the little dog's up on his hind legs, jumping up at the big dog, who's kind of glancing over as if he, you know, can't can't even be bothered. Uh, so this painting is also important to me for what it represents, and it represents the way that Telfer was able to grow its collection through amazing and significant acquisitions directly from the artists themselves during their lifetimes. So this work was purchased by Telfer in 1911, the same year that the painting was created, and this was a purchase negotiated by Gary Melchers, who was the museum's fine arts advisor at the time. Because Melchers was an artist himself, he was able to negotiate fantastic deals for important paintings. And the other paintings from this series by Bellows are in collections like the, the Met, um, the Whitney, the Brooklyn Museum, the Pennsylvania Academy, some of the most important early American art museums and Telfair was, was right there with them. Um, Bellows numbered this painting as one of his six most important paintings that he did in his lifetime. So he saw the merit in it as well. Um, and it has been a beloved addition to Telfer's collection ever since 1911. So I can have my next slide, please. And then the, the next slide here, this is one work of art, but it is representative of an entire collection held by Telfair. Um, this is a drawing by Khalil Gibran, who was a Lebanese born poet uh, and also a visual artist. And Telfair owns the largest collection of Gibran's visual art anywhere in the United States. And one of the biggest collections in the world outside of his um, hometown in Lebanon, and then another major collection in Mexico. And the, the remarkable thing about this collection of, of artwork is just how Gibran is able to take the beauty and the poetic nature of his writings and then translate it into these really gorgeous images, oftentimes centering on things like the idea of the feminine divine or these goddess figures. And here I love how you have the central goddess figure who is giving life to the, the throngs of people below her just with this, with this gesture as they all look up towards her. Uh, he was a big believer in the power of women and was nurtured and encouraged by many women in his own life and career. And it was through one of those women that this collection came to Telfair Museums. A woman named Mary Haskell, who later became Mary Haskell Minus, was one of his early sponsors up in Boston, where he spent his, his youth and his early career. And she ended up donating her entire personal collection of Gibran's artwork to Telfair Museums because she had chosen to reside here for the, the last years of her life. And um, even as a young woman had been familiar with Telfair and had written a letter to Gibran saying, you know, I've been thinking about what I'll do with your painting someday. I'm thinking maybe that lovely little art gallery in Savannah that Gary Melchers chooses pictures for would be a good home for them. Um, so this work is a lovely work in its own right, but it also is representative of another important collection holding for the museum. And I'm thrilled to have it included here. And with that, I've hit my allotted five minutes. So I will yield the floor. Thank you again for having me here tonight.
Hi, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Erin Dunn and I'm the Associate Curator of Modern Contemporary Art. The first work I'm going to be speaking to is a painting by abstract expressionist Ethel Schwabacher. Schwabacher described her artistic practice as a lifelong search for the place where, which she identified as a point of maximum concentration and energy on the canvas. Here the eye is drawn to the central yellow circular form that exists bounded by the warm tones of the oranges, reds, and blues that create a bold composition with striking color. The rock, painted in 1961, was created during a period in Schwabacher's long career when she focused on bright colors and jagged, almost disquietingly broad brush strokes. Next slide, please. Telfair Museum's collection boasts a small yet powerful group of work by female abstract expressionists whose accomplishments were lauded in their own time, but have been historically neglected. Paired with painter Elaine de Kooning and, and sculptor and gallerist Betty Parsons in a recent rotation of Telfair's exhibition, Complex Uncertainties, Artists in Post-War America, we can focus on another aspect of abstraction. Although art historical discussions often couch the movement in terms of heroic masculine action, Ethel Schwabacher's work encourages us to consider another facet at play, the deeply personal act of expressing oneself in paint. Her compositions were often personal in theme, but also markedly formal, and her influences ranged widely from Greek mythology to poetry to womanhood and childbirth, and she described her style as lyric epic. Next slide, please. Schwabacher began her career as a sculptor and transitioned to figurative painting before finally finding ins um, inspiration in surrealism and automatism. The latter was introduced to her by her mentor, uh, painter Arshel Gorky. After his suicide in 1948, she continued her lyrical abstractions and actually became his first biographer. Although Schwabacher grew up in a privileged family, her life was punctuated by the deaths of loved ones, psychological breaks, and suicide attempts. She always returned to art making as a means of expression, finding comfort in the creative act, which she described as, quote, more like birth, where something comes into being than death, where disintegration occurs, growth producing energy rather than an energy that blows things apart. Next slide, please. My next chosen work is a painting by Washington DC based artist, Sam Gilliam. Erupting on the screen, the work vibrates with acid greens, hot pinks, and teal blues, which are just a few of the vibrant colors that are soaked stained in the canvas of Gilliam's and Lana. The saturated canvas projects from the wall through Gilliam's distinctive use of the beveled edge stretcher bars. This feature adds dimension and physicality to his paintings and blurs the lines between painting and sculpture. Next slide. On view in Telfair's 2016 exhibition, Landmark, a decade of collecting at the Jepson Center, you can be drawn in by the bright pulse of the commanding work. Landmark celebrated the collection built in the decade since the Jepson Center opened its doors. Gilliam's and Lana was donated to Telfair Museums after the museum hosted a spectacular retrospective of his work the same year that the Jepson Center opened in 2006. The retrospective was indicative of the excitingly contemporary direction of Telfair Museums through the addition of the Jepson Center. Telfair Museums now proudly holds three works by Gilliam in its collection, each piece revealing another aspect of the artist's relentless innovation. Next slide. An artist known for experimentation, Gilliam often works in series and devises certain structures and systems of order to work within. It has been argued that his most significant contribution to art history has been the erasure of easy definitions delineating paint, painting and sculpture. In creating objects that act as both forms, Gilliam removes the need for such boundaries. After his arrival in Washington DC in 1961 and his association with artists such as Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland, he was heralded as a second generation member of the Washington Color School and the only African-American artist associated with it. However, his work went beyond their investigations into abstraction and really questioned the structures of painting itself. Gilliam was initially acknowledged by the art world for his draped, folded, and soaked canvases freed from their stretcher supports, which were inspired by the sight of women hanging laundry on a clothesline and first exhibited in 1969 at the Corcoran Gallery in DC. 
Next slide. Gilliam is an incredible artist whose artistic practice continues to stimulate viewers who experience the electric pull of his works, provoked through his use of texture and color and his constant willingness to experiment. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, my name is Anselin Bayan. I'm an assistant curator at Telfair Museums. I'm really excited to share my two picks with you tonight and to tell you more about the works uh, and the artists that created them. So uh, let's on to the first pick. In his time, Henry Oswa Tanner was famous for being the most distinguished and successful African-American artist of the 19th century. Born on the eve of the Civil War, Tanner was the son of a formerly enslaved woman who fled the South through the Underground Railroad, and his father was a college-educated teacher and minister who had become a bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1880, at the age of 21, Tanner enrolled in the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and was taught by the renowned American realist painter, Thomas Aikens. Citing the particularly arduous climate of racial discrimination in the United States, Tanner chose to move to Europe to pursue his artistic training, explaining, quote, I cannot fight prejudice and paint at the same time. He settled in Paris and enrolled at the Académie Julien, where he was notably mentored by the Orientalist artist Jean-Benjamin uh, Jean Constant. Next slide, please. Tanner made some of his most famous works in France, uh, such as The Banjo Lesson on the left and Raising of Lazarus on the right. The banjo lesson is emblematic of a short-lived phase of Tanner's career, when the artist produced a number of genre scenes portraying uh, black subjects in a casual yet dignified manner, while the latter represents what Tanner would become famous for, his religious and orientalist paintings. His raising of Lazarus uh, notably won a medal at the Parisian Salon, and the French state purchased the painting, which was one of the highest honors uh, bestowed on artists in the country at this time. Later, Tanner Riley recalled how the American press chronicled his achievement, uh, quote, when my Lazarus was bought by the French government, it was telegraphed to the States, quote, a Negro sells picture to the French government. Now a paper in Baltimore wanted a photograph of this Negro. Of course they had none. So out they go and photograph the first dock hand they come across that looked like he may be my distant ancestor when he came from Africa, end quote. Next slide, please. The untitled work in Telfair Museum's collection is emblematic of an earlier phase of Tanner's career, when the artist painted seascapes, harbors, and a variety of maritime-themed works. It was once owned by the American author Zane Gray, best known for his Western novels. At his death in 1939, Zane willed the painting to his gatekeeper. What we know um, from our records is that the work ended up at a garage sale uh, before retiring to its permanent home at Telfair Museum's. One can see in the seascape's hazy yet well-modeled composition, composition, the same studied control of light that features heavily in his best genre scenes and religious fantasies. Uh, next slide, please. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Helen Levitt studied photography at the Art Student League in the city. It was also in New York that she met the celebrated French photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who inspired her to turn her lens towards candid scenes and ordinary events and people. Bresson coined the term, quote, the decisive moment, which refers to the fleeting instant in which visual and psychological elements come together to perfectly express the essence of a situation. Uh, according to Bresson, this was a photographer's calling to capture these ephemeral uh, moments. He would uh, later say, quote, to me, photography is the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of an event, as well as a precise organization of forms which give that event its proper expression. So to seize these decisive moments, Levitt uh, utilized a handheld 35 millimeter camera with a right angle viewfinder to capture her subjects unaware and preserve the spontaneity of the moment. Next slide, please. Throughout her career, Levitt frequently photographed children in the urban environment of New York. These two images, some of Levitt's most recognizable photographs, are also part of Telfair's permanent collection. Looking back at the uniqueness of her work and the particular period which it documents, she notably explained, quote, 
children used to be outside. Now the streets are empty. People are indoors looking at the television or something. Next slide, please. This photograph was taken on a busy New York sidewalk in the 1940s. It shows children engaged in play in the foreground, apparently unsupervised. A child on the road bends down to grab a piece of shattered glass as the others look on. At the center, two children grip a large empty frame through which emerges a child on a bicycle. This double framing, Levitt's photograph framing the scene and the wooden frame outlining the boy on the bicycle creates a poetic mirroring effect, an image within an image. Through this one moment, Levitt captures the beauty of the everyday and the inevitable dangers of child's play. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone and welcome. I'm Ben Simons, Executive Director, and I'll be sharing two paintings by Child Hassam today. Um, Child Hassam was the pioneer and leading practitioner of American Impressionism. And during an incredibly lengthy career, he created over 2000 oils, watercolors, and pastels and over 400 etchings, dry points, and lithographs altogether. Um, he hailed from Dorchester, Massachusetts and established himself early on in Boston before he moved to Paris with his, with his new wife in 1886. And there he enrolled at the Academy Julian, as so many of the artists in the Telfair's permanent collection did, and absorbed uh, a wide range of influences of contemporary styles, including French Impressionism. And at the Academy, he met, among others, fellow American artist Gary Melchers, who would later be very instrumental in acquiring Hassam's work for Telfair. He returned to New York in 1889, and he settled there for life, first on Lower Fifth Avenue, and then uh, later on 57th Street between Fifth and Sixth Avenues. And here in, in the city, he became the leading chronicler in the American and precious mode of city life with cityscapes that focused on the poetic modernism embodied by monumental structures like the Brooklyn Bridge, the Flatiron Building, the city's new skyscrapers, which were made possible by steel frame construction, and the bustling energy of New York's avenues, particularly Fifth Avenue, which was the favorite subject for Hassan. His, Hassam's cheerful and even romanticized images of the city were a far cry from the gritty portrayals of the squalor and overcrowding in the city's less genteel neighborhoods explored by the Ashcan School. Next slide, please. In May of 1916, inspired by the preparedness parade on Fifth Avenue, Hassam created the first in his series of fam famous series of flag paintings, which would eventually number over 30 works. America would not actually enter the war until May of 1917, but already the country was gripped by a rising patriotic fervor and an urgency to come to the aid of her, her future allies, Great Britain and France. Hassam said, quote, that was, there was that preparedness day, and I looked up the avenue and saw these wonderful flags waving, and I painted the series of flags after that. The seas of flags draped across the city's dramatic skylines pointed not only to a growing American pride on the world stage, but also to a rising sense of the country as a global power made possible by her technological prowess and, ability, and industry. In Telfair's flag painting, Avenue of the Allies, dated to 1917, he positions two American flags conspicuously in between the French tricolor and the Union Jack, lending prominence and centrality to, to old glory. The view focuses in on the group of flags against the crop background of the old Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which was later torn down to make room way for the Empire State Building, and the Knickerbocker Trust and Safe Deposit Company building to the north. As one contemporary critic wrote, Mr. Hassam has done for the flag what Monet did for the haystack, shown it under all conceivable conditions of atmosphere and made beautiful by the caress of light. Hassam exhibited a group of 23 flag paintings on November the 11th, 1918 at the Durand Royal Galleries in New York and in subsequent shows, but he never actually succeeded in selling them together as a group, which was his intention. Next slide, please, Harry. In his 18, 1904 canvas, Brooklyn Bridge in Winter, he presents another great monument of American modernity, the Brooklyn Bridge, wrapped, as one critic wrote, quote, in a ghostly mist that has begun to eat away its massive towers, its sweeping cables, and its solid arch. Hassam has caught the rhythmic music, the sense of mystery. The Gothic Revival pointed arches of the bridge's towers are visible in silhouette 
and the whole structure looms like a 20th century cathedral in a haze of snow. Hassam is less interested in architectural details and outlines than in the quote, arrangement of opalescent tones as he pays tributes to the building, buildings and structures that he himself considered works of art. He said of the city, quote, to me, New York is the most wonderful city in the world. No street, no section of Paris or any other city I have seen is equal to New York. The painting was purchased by Gary Melchers himself directly from the artist and entered Telfair's collection in, in 1907. Thank you. And this is, <laughs> I end with this shot of um, a fla the flag painting in the White House collections under two, two different presidents. Um, it's been a, it's an important part of those collections. And you see here um, uh, Reagan and Obama on the phone uh, in the company of, of one of Hassan's flag paintings. Hi, and moving along, uh, I'm Harry DeLorme, uh, Senior Curator of Education for Telfer Museums. And uh, in my 30 plus years uh, here at Telfer, I've been fortunate to work on a number of curatorial projects researching the artists of our region, particularly self-taught artists, as well as artists working in new media. Um, so tonight I'll briefly show two works that are on either end of that spectrum. And I'm gonna start with this work by one of the most fascinating artists that I have run across over the years. Uh, this is the work by the African-American sailor and self-taught artist William O. Golding, whose drawing here of the tugboat William F. McCauley gives you an inclination of his deep ties to Savannah. Golding, also known as Golden, uh, condensed 49 years of maritime experience into perhaps 120 drawings produced largely from his hospital bed in Savannah in the 1930s. The son of a Reconstruction era lawmaker from Liberty County, Georgia, Golding was kidnapped from the Savannah waterfront, tricked into coming aboard a ship um, as a, when he was a child um, to serve as a cabin boy. And he spent 22 years serving on sail and steamships before he made it back to his home again. Uh, in the 1930s, let's see, in the 1930s, Golding was an intermittent patient at the United States Marine Hospital here in Savannah. The building is still there today near the Owens Thomas House and is now SCAD's Bradley Hall. Golding was a patient there for a decade or more where he was treated for chronic bronchitis. He was nicknamed Deep Sea and he swapped stories with fellow patients and rendered his experiences in remarkably expressive pencil and crayon drawings. He drew numerous vessels he claimed to have seen or served on, including warships, whalers in the Arctic, steam yachts of America's elite of the period, and foreign ports he had visited. Here you see his drawings of the USS Constellation uh, up at the top on the uh, upper right, and below the port of Saigon, uh, then part of French Indochina. He developed this unique style brimming with visual invention, like an ever-present sun. If you can look at the upper right of both of those drawings, you'll see the sun, and it appears in the form of a compass rose like you might find on a nautical map. His works are rich in detail and really reward uh, close viewing. Several of his works depict the Savannah waterfront and city landmarks, including this image of the tugboat William F. McCauley, which the Golding depicts cruising downriver past the waterfront as if to meet a vessel entering the port. Built in 1894 for the Propeller Towboat Company of Savannah, the McCauley, which you see in the photograph on the right in real life, uh, was named for the towing company's then secretary and treasurer, who later became president of the Savannah Bank and Trust Company. You can see the, the bank's 15-story uh, building, which is then, was then and is now the tallest building in downtown Savannah, uh, there toward the center in the background of that image. And if you look closely at, uh, at this work, you'll see other landmarks uh, from downtown Savannah of the period, including the Hotel Savannah, the Pulaski Hotel, the Savannah Morning News Building, Germania Bank, Crest Department Store, all of which existed when this image was created. And Golding has really flattened the space out to compress River Street, Bay Street, Broughton Street, all into this one plane in that image. Interestingly, he includes the old city exchange on the far left of the background. And the city exchange was long gone by the time the Golding depicted uh, the Macaulay, but it would have been there when he was a child, when he was first uh, kidnapped uh, and left Savannah. So let's move on ahead. Uh, sorry, before we move ahead, one more thing I wanted to mention is that um, this tug was uh, later briefly commissioned by the US Navy 
1918. It was later sold to the Atlantic Towing Company, which Golding mentions down there in the lower right corner of the drawing. Uh, and he likely encountered this tub when he was back in Savannah in the 1920s or the early 30s. Um, we're really looking forward to presenting more of Golding's work in a large exhibition that we'll be having at the Jepson Center in 2022. And moving along to my second selection, uh, again, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, this connects to my work um, <clears throat> programming the Pulse Art and Technology Festival here at Telfair. Um, it's a piece by the, by the contemporary Swiss-born artist Katja Loher. Uh, you're looking at a video sculpture entitled To Whom Does the Air Belong To? Uh, this is a work from Loher's video bubble series, and it appears sleek and futuristic on the outside, contrasting with the nature-focused videos within. The videos are set within hand-blown glass bubbles, which allow us to view these works as if under a microscope. But what we find are not merely insects and flowers, but matters that concern us as human beings who depend on them. The bubble form and the material, glass, also speak to the fragility of our ecosystems. <clears throat> Katya Loher creates video sculptures and environments that blend technology with performance, collaborating with artists of different disciplines, including choreographers, dancers, costume designers, and glass blowers. And you see a dancer below <clears throat> uh, dressed as a bee um, who appears in, in, the, um, in the sculpture that you saw. Loher's sculptures and installations take the form of projections on weather balloon sized video planets, as she calls them as well as smaller domes, glass bubbles, and nests embedded with video screens. A number of her works, including the piece in our collection, uh, as well as the video portals, video planets, and an endangered series seen in this image um, uh, of her exhibition at, uh, from Telfair in 2015, uh, again, focus on the natural world and environmental themes. Um, the exhibition that you see here in the image was entitled Bee Planet and speaks to her interest in the decline of pollinators, which you see in the work in our collection. And here I'm showing you details of the video um, in the work um, from our collection. Uh, you'll see three different uh, parts of the video sequence there. And in this work, uh, the, you know, one video, the one on the left, shows performers costumed as bees participating in what's known as the waggle dance, a movement that bees use to communicate about food sources. In the other bubble, costume characters represent the stamens of flowers that are visited by the bees. As the sequence plays out, these bees, uh, which are people dressed as bees, gradually transform and their wings give way to human arms. So you can see in the image on the lower left, um, the bees have one wing and one human arm. Eventually, um, those, uh, those wings give way to, to human arms and uh, these, uh, the, the bees reveal themselves as costume workers. And what Loher is getting at here is that um, if the bees and other pollinators disappear, then humans are going to have to figure out the work that, you know, what they do, how they do what they do, if we want to continue enjoying these, uh, the foods that, um, that they help produce. And so uh, Loher was inspired to create this series by um, what was known as colony collapse disorder, this phenomenon which resulted in the declines of worker honeybee populations, possibly caused in part by agricultural pesticides. And so what first appears to be a window onto a microcosm of nature is revealed to be a glimpse into a future in which humans may have to take over the works, uh, the work of pollinators if they disappear. And uh, with that, that is the, uh, the end of our presentation. I'm going to ask all of our speakers to come back on camera. And uh, we would be glad to entertain any questions that you have. If you have questions for uh, any of the speakers tonight, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to answer those right now. We have a couple that are in there already, actually uh, quite a few in there already. So uh, let's see if we can go ahead and get right to those. So this uh, looks like a question for Shannon. Um, why do we call the needleworks samplers? That's, that's the first part of the question. And there's another one about, about uh, uh, Dave's pot later on. So first of all, the, the sampler question. Yeah, so the samplers are really cool because they are uh, these pieces of fabric where people, often younger people, have practiced the different stitches that they've learned. So if you look back at one, uh, you can see all different types of stitches on the um, on the one piece. And Harry, do you want to put it back up really quickly? Uh, it might be a little hard to get back to that. Easily. Okay, uh, don't worry about it, but it's, um, I think it's on our website under the collection. It's not our website, it's Telfair Museum's website now. Um, but take a look at it, look at it up close, and you can see all the different stitches, which is really cool. 
Great, and another one for Shannon. Uh, what material was used to make Dave's uh, jars and pots? These are all clay. They are, and uh, particularly you notice that not only the pottery that Dave was enslaved at, but other potteries were also located in that same area of Edgeville, South Carolina. And that's because the clay in the soil in that area was particularly uh, well suited for making pottery. So that is the material it was made of. And uh, you can, it, the clay from different areas is really distinctive. And we have a couple of questions for Courtney here. Uh, what is the size of George Bellows snow capped river? It is gorgeous. Uh, what is the size of the scale of it? I guess it's hard to, if you haven't seen it in person, it's hard to, to guess. Yeah, I'm not a numbers person, but like, so this would be like one quarter of it, I would say, if that, if that's a helpful scale. Um, it's, it's like, I couldn't probably grab it lengthwise, but if I had to take it out of a burning building, I could grab the top and the bottom. Um, so it's, it is a large canvas. Yeah. It is a large painting, yeah, but it's it, large enough, I think, that you feel immersed in it when you get up close to it, I think. Absolutely. Um, and then secondly, how is the uh, how is the Gibran watercolor preserved or displayed? Uh, we're asked if it's under glass, and yes, we do show these under glass typically. Absolutely. So like all works on paper, the Gibran works on paper only come out once every few years so that they can rest in between uh, exhibition times. And so it would normally be out for maybe three to six months and then rest for, you know, a year or two uh, to preserve it. But when we display them, we display them in uh, museum standard acid free mats and under plexi actually um, with UV protection. We, I said we, Telfair displays them. I no longer display them. And yeah, we have we have uh, we have a couple here for um, for Aaron. Um, let's see. Uh, when was um, Ms. Schwabacher uh, living when she made the rock? Uh, where was she living? I'm sorry. Well, she um, was born and died in New York City and spent most of her life there. I do know that the rock was exhibited in 1962 at Betty Parsons Gallery. So it's likely that it was painted in New York City. Um, and sometimes place is important for Schwabacher's work, but I think really it's more about her kind of um, emotional and kind of unconscious mind that she's trying to evoke through her painting. So the rock could have multiple significances. It could be a place, it could be a reference to Greek mythology, possibly Sisyphus and the rock. Um, it could represent childbirth or the womb. Um, so it's one of those things where you you can also bring a lot of meaning to the painting as well. And another one uh, about uh, Sam Gilliam, or actually a couple about Sam Gilliam. Can you describe uh, how Sam Gilliam's uh, landmark uh, was made and uh, are Gilliam's works uh, hung permanently at Telfair? Yeah, so the landmark exhibition was um, actually, I think Courtney curated that. It was 10 works from the collection to kind of represent the collecting history of since the Jepson Center opened. Um, so we included Gilliam's in that uh, one to represent kind of the, you know, pride that we hold in having Gilliam work, Gilliam's work in our collection. And I think we chose in Lana because it is such a powerful work. Um, and I wanted to include that image because it shows the beveled edge of the painting. So you can see how it projects off the wall and isn't just kind of more of a flattened canvas against the wall. And the carousel works, the kind of draped canvas works, that was a representation of his kind of um, paintings freed from the stretcher supports. So I wanted to show that kind of constant innovation and experimentation that the artist is working with, but those are not part of the permanent collection. If anyone would like to donate one to be part of the permanent collection, we would love that, so. <laughs> and we received three uh, terrific uh, Gilliam works um, by donation actually. So uh, we're really, uh, really grateful to have those pieces. Um, a lot more questions. Oh, uh, Donna has given us a number of questions. I'm going to skip around just a little bit. I'm going to come back, Donna, in just a second. Uh, but I'm going to get to one from Patricia here very quickly. Uh, this is another one for Shannon. Can you review the initials uh, discussed in the Dave sculptures? Sure. So um, David Drake, uh, there's an estimate by scholars that, that he probably produced over 40,000 vessels in his life, which is incredible. Mm. Um, and many of them would not have been marked at all. Uh, many had just initials and dates or maybe his name and a date. 
Um, and then a few of the really exceptional ones have those fascinating, uh, you know, poems or verses that he made up, which is really cool. Uh, but the, the initials I referenced in talking about this one specifically were L.M. for Lewis Miles, who was his enslaver at the time that he produced that particular pot. Um, and when he wrote his own name, he generally only put Dave. I'm not aware of him using an initial for his own name. Great. And one from Rebecca uh, about, um, this is for Erin. Uh, what did you, uh, she asked what you were saying about um, the elsewhere in regard to Schwabacher. Yeah, so Schwabacher kind of had a mantra for her paintings where it was the place where. So it's the idea that there's kind of a central locus on the painting that draws all the energy and concentration. So that's something I would say if you find a Schwabacher at another museum to kind of search for that place where, where it's kind of all the energy is drawn to. Great, and uh, let's see, we're gonna go back to some more from Donna here. Um, this is for Ansel. And did Tanner draw for his own pleasure or were any of his works commissioned? While I don't know if our untitled piece was commissioned, I knew that, I do know that the banjo lesson was, um, uh, was initially a drawing meant for an illustration for a children's magazine. Uh, and then he was inspired uh, by his work, his commission work to make the painting. And then I believe the um, raising of Lazarus was just sort of um, prompted by his own ambition to win a medal at the salon, which would, gar which would bring the artist more commissions. And another one about uh, Helen Levitt. Um, this is a question, did, did she need to obtain permission to photograph other people's children? And was she allowed to sell these photos? Uh, <laughs> I think this, these, those works were created at a different era than, uh, <laughs> than the one we're living in. Uh, I think, so. the, yeah, the right, the viewfinder, sort of the sneaky right angle viewfinder makes makes me think that she was sort of not asking for permission and really <laughs> getting away with it. <laughs> That's right. She had the special right angle viewfinder so she could pretend she was looking this way, but she was really photographing something, you know, in the, another direction. Uh, and then one for Ben here, uh, are any of Hassam's works uh, located uh, on Long Island or any of the East End museums or in New York City? I'm sure there are quite a few of them. Yeah, ab absolutely. And Hassam purchased a home in East Hampton, I think in the late uh, teens with his wife and spent many summers there. He traveled to most of the major art colonies in the summers he would get out of New York and, and be on the road and, and abroad as well. But um, I know that the I, I know that the Met has has you know en enormous Hassam holdings and the Brooklyn Museum as well. But the parish too um, has over a dozen of his works, and that's you know that's a that's a great that's a great collection out there uh, at the parish. So certainly um, many of his his um, oils and also etchings um, portraying houses in East Hampton, for instance, historic homes as well. So he did a lot of work centered there and spent a lot of time there. And all, most all of those institutions have significant holdings of his work. Great, and uh, another one. This is one about uh, one for me about uh, uh, William Golding. Uh, what is the significance of Golding's drawing of the sun, which is similar in several of his drawings? And yes, that actually uh, is a personal symbol of his, his that appears in nearly all of his drawings. There are a few that do not have that symbol, but uh, but he draws the sun. Usually, it's it looks like it's setting you know, or peeking out from behind a, you know, a, 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 a group of clouds. Um, but it, it's, he draws it in the form of a compass rose. And a compass rose is something, I think, uh, I think he, he kind of adopted that as personal symbols. It's, it's a personal symbol. It's something you find on nautical maps. It really, it tends to represent like the cardinal directions. Uh, and you find it on a compass. If you look at a compass, a handheld compass, or even the compass that, that app that comes on your phone, you might, sometimes might see something that looks like a compass rose. But I think Golding, um, I think Golding again used that as a personal symbol to kind of talk about his experience and his his wanderings across the globe because uh, he said that he had visited you know practically every continent uh, and you know had, had been everywhere in the seven seas. Uh, it's a quote from Golding, uh, and so um, I think it represented that that global experience that he had. Let's see, I think we might have another one that's come in. Uh, was Golding literate is another question that just came in. And uh, actually he, um, his, his uh, stepfather was William A. Golding who founded the Dorchester Academy, which was a, which is a historic school for African-American youth in Liberty County, Georgia. And uh, from one of the census records that he turns up in, it says that he 
had uh, achieved two grades of education. He left Savannah sometime between the age of six and the age of eight. Uh, and, uh, in, uh, and you know, in some of the census records, it's, it, it notes that he didn't have an education, but he could read and write. And, and in fact, he left two letters, which is how we know most of what we know about his work. All right, any more questions? We, uh, we can entertain a couple more if you have them. If you do have another question, please put it in the chat. Uh, the Curator's Choice exhibition opens up tomorrow at the Jepson Center. So uh, we hope that you'll all come in and see it in person. Uh, and uh, I think we also have, uh, we also have the, the book, uh, the catalog of the exhibition that, that will be coming out um, at the end of the first week in May, I believe. And uh, I don't know, Anselin, do you still have the to show and tell version there? Okay. <laughs> there you can see Anselin is holding up the, uh, a copy of the book. So that will be out shortly. And, uh, you can pick up that. Uh, it's a great little guide to some of Telfer's greatest hits, as well as some perhaps lesser, less familiar uh, works from our permanent collection, uh, all works chosen by our curators. So, um, Well, and I will say that it's very interesting to compare it to, to the 2005 catalog of the permanent collection highlights, which, and I congratulate all of you on all of the work you've done to broaden the collections and diversify the representation in the collections, and that's ongoing, but I think Curator's Choice really reflects all of that strategic work and thinking. Great, so let's see, any more questions? Last call? All right, thank you for all the wonderful questions tonight. Um, hopefully I didn't miss anybody, and uh, again, I hope that uh, all of you will come in and see the, uh, the exhibition, which opens tomorrow at the Jepson Center. Uh, we have the show will be up for quite a long time. It'll be up into early uh, 2022, so you've got plenty of time to see it. Uh, but uh, we do have a Super Museum Sunday uh, this Sunday uh, going on in Savannah, so the, the Jepson Center will be open uh, for that as well. So um, again, we hope to uh, to see you all soon soon at Telfer Museums. Uh, we hope to make this available late video available later for anyone who missed the program tonight. Uh, thank you all for for tuning in. And I uh, hope you all have a great night and hope to see you soon at the museum. Thanks to all of our great Thank curators you. who participated. Thank <laughs> you, Courtney. Thank you, Shannon, for coming back. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye, guys. Good night, everyone. Good night.